Let's talk some rugby union, because excitement's starting to build at the start of the 2014 Six Nations Championship, just a few weeks away. Wales, the defending champions, you may remember, and following their strong representation in the Lions Tour victory over Australia, there should be a lot of optimism as Wales prepare to defend their title, absolutely crushing England in that last match. However... The Welsh preparations are being dogged by a row in their domestic game. We've been here before, the Welsh Rugby Union, and now the regions are in dispute over funding, the exodus of Welsh players, and an Anglo-Welsh league. Our own Chris Jones explains how it got to this point. Well, one of the main issues in this dispute is the continued uncertainty over the Heineken Cup, which will not exist in its current form next season. The English clubs have a new tournament they're keen to establish and, crucially, a new broadcaster. We are here and we're moving forward from here. There's no purpose in continuing to play with one's food. Eventually you have to eat. We're doing something which is creative. In fact, if I play with the words, we're actually doing something. The Welsh regions, they want in on this, attracted by the extra money on offer. But the Welsh Rubber Union are reluctant to sanction it. They want to commit the regions to a European competition organised by the current body, European Rugby Cup, or ERC. Now, this was one of the terms of that participation agreement, which the regions refused to sign on New Year's Eve. And this turned what was an impasse into a full-scale civil war in Welsh rugby. We, as, as four regions, went through the participation agreement in detail, prepared some points as to what has worked, what hasn't worked. We submitted that to the union and we were told, sorry, not for discussion. Well, sorry, that is unreasonable behaviour. However, despite talk of breakaway leagues and new regions being set up, both parties insist they want to settle their differences and avoid any doomsday scenarios. And the union last week sent a new proposal out to the regions, which is currently under consideration. But while the situation remains unresolved, key Welsh players, such as the national captain Sam Warburton and the Lions hero Lee Halfpenny, they're out of contract and in limbo, none the wiser about what the future holds. I'm just waiting to hear back now and hopefully get an offer in the next, obviously sooner rather than later, um, but I'm hoping that it can be tied up you know, this side of Christmas, then you can move on. It could well have an impact on the Wales team as they bid to retain their Six Nations crown next month. Yes, of course, this is a row over money, but it's also a row over power and control of the game on these shores. In England, the clubs are independent of their union, the RFU. It's the opposite in Ireland and Scotland, where the union have total control over the provinces. In Wales, though, it's somewhere in the middle. But for how much longer? I know it's complicated, but that is the row in a nutshell. The other voices you heard there, apart from Chris Jones, the chairman of Premiership Clubs, Quentin Smith, Gareth Davis, the CEO of the Dragons, and the Wales captain, Sam Warburton. Well, joining me to discuss it, an Englishman and a Welshman, the Scarlet's chief executive, Mark Davis, and the former England hooker, Brian Moore. Let's get straight to the nub of the problem, Mark Davis. Um, what was the participation agreement between the WRU and the regions then? Uh, say that again what was the public what 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 is the situation mm. between the wru and the region the participation agreement well the situation is very simple um the regions were it simply wasn't possible for the regions to commit to extend uh the agreement by the deadline of the 31st of december because the wru is not currently in a position to fulfill its contractual obligations on the other side of the agreement by defining the competitions that we're playing in and the revenues that those competitions generate. So what you have is a, a, an ability to define one side of the commitments of an agreement in terms of costs, protocols and so on, but absolutely no clarity of the other side. So it's literally as simple as that. Mm. Brian, how do you see this? Who's, who's in the wrong? Who's in the right? Who's being unreasonable? <laughs> It stems really from your opening, which was very succinct, actually. Hooray! You, in my in my opinion, <laughs> you, you you can't have this hybrid. Um, in Wales and Scotland, it's very clear. In England, it's very clear. The longer it, the Welsh regions are not are either able to be independent or they are bought out and run effectively by the WRU, you are going to have this problem. It's like saying, well, off you go, make a lot, make your own money, we'll give you a little bit if you get into trouble, but uh, we have to have control of this. And you know, neither side has sufficient control 
for certainty to go forward. It surely has to be one or the other. Right. Well, as if on cue, um, a famous Welshman has scored against a Welsh side for an English one. Alistair Eakin. He's the man of the moment, George North, who, of course, performs such heroics for the Lions and has been doing similarly for Northampton in recent weeks, has just scored an absolute screamer from about 80 metres out. Turnover ball for Northampton on their own 22. He skipped down the blind side. A couple of uh, defenders were evaded right on the edge of the touchline and then he absolutely piled down that left wing and uh, it was up to Richard Fussell to try to chase him down. The opposition fullback, the Ospreys fullback, couldn't get to him and George North North went over for the try. The conversion has just hit the uprights and rebounded, so no further two points as far as Northampton are concerned, but a brilliant try from George North, and Northampton now leading the Ospreys just after half-time by 17 points to three. Yeah, we're talking about the arguments in particularly Welsh rugby, uh, the regions in dispute over funding, the exodus of Welsh players, etc, etc, etc. We're talking about it with Brian Moore, the former England hooker and BBC commentator, and also the Scarlet's chief executive, Mark Davis. Let's hear now though from someone connected with the regions as well Andrew Hoare is the CEO of Ospreys and he spoke before their match against Northampton to Alistair Eakin. Andrew first of all can we start with the participation agreement which is sitting on your desk the players particularly the WRU would like central contracts for the for the big stars the half pennies the Warburton's um, the Alan Wynne Joneses of this world that's something you're opposed to no, the PwC report was very clear that central contracts were not the answer to our issues. Collaboration was. So our issue is we want greater collaboration on the finer points. And I think England have done this really well. They're working together to find a solution. And in our game, we're not. And so the key crux to us isn't central contracts. We find that's a red herring. The key crux to us, there is not enough money in the Welsh game to undertake the activity we want to do, which is build infrastructure, have more involvement in the community and keep Welsh players here. That's the key principle we want to work on. And are you given any assurances within that document that more money will be made available for those things to happen? I think there's a lot of discussion and we've got to give the feedback we've got till Tuesday to give that. Um, and so we've got to work through that and the devil's in the detail and believe you me, in a you know, 200 odd page de document there is a lot of detail. What about the European situation because everything is intrinsically linked to that isn't it the success or otherwise of the Rugby Champions Cup which you're in support of will underpin whether you can go forward commercially collectively as regions yeah, no, we, look, we see the RCC as a, as a really positive step um, forward. Um, it'll bring that increased revenue. Um, it will enable us to have to stand on our own two feet commercially. It keeps a large amount of the governance with the national bodies. And I think the national bodies have to be careful. If you look at rugby league, cricket, um, football, sooner or later, a TV company or a broadcaster come in and paid enough money that it just blew everything to bits. We're better to actually keep trying to work together. Fundamentally, are we are we talking about a, a standoff uh, over control of commercial arrangements? You would like to be able to take control of that as businesses, and the WRU would like to keep control of all of that themselves, yes? I think there is an element of control, but I also think that the, there's a wider picture that the Six Nations can't agree on, a, on an ERC competition. So we need to find something, um, and we've found something that we think could work would uh, progress the game in the direction that it needs to go. Um, well, and it's, a, you know yourself at work, the leadership style of the employer has changed. There's got to be greater autonomy now, but also accountability, and we're open to that. So that's um, what we're looking to do, and at the moment, as we say, we've got a competition we believe will work. The Six Nations, as it stands, don't. Just to play devil's advocate for a minute, if I suggested to you that the WRU would actually like to run the regions down so that they were bankrupt, they could take over the regions, they wouldn't have to pay back the money that the investors have put in over the last decade and more, mm. that would make life rather easy for them. Mm. Do you think that's a, an actual objective of theirs? Um, potentially, it feels that way sometimes, it does. I think um, what I'd also say is if you can get uh, a large amount of control with the regional entities taking the risk, um, that's a nice position to be in too. Um, so would they want to take over complete control? No. Would they want us to take the risk? I think yes, um, which makes it nigh on impossible to operate as an entity. Um, you know, you've got to be in control of your own destiny. We're limited companies in our own right. 
um, and we've had a lot of people that work very hard on on building these brands. It's a shame that you know when we've assisted in delivering uh, the amount of success the Welsh national team has had, which was why you know I was here before we went regionalised. I still remember us getting beaten by 50 points by you know many teams when we were clubs. We've now built these entities and now we're slowly but surely destroying them. It just doesn't seem right. That's the Ospreys CEO, Andrew Hall, speaking to Alistair Eakin. Uh, we did try and get someone on to talk to us from the Welsh Rugby Union to give us a little bit of balance, but uh, they declined. So we are talking to the Scarlet's chief executive, Mark Davis, and the former England hooker, Brian Moore. Um, Mark, why should the rugby fan, particularly in Wales, be concerned about what's happening here? Well, ultimately, all the rugby fan wants to do is watch rugby every Correct. week. Um, and this is quite dry, isn't it, for, for, for most rugby fans? It's quite difficult to get your head round. It is. It's not a burden they should have to put up with. Um, they just want to watch good rugby. They want to watch competitive rugby. Uh, they want to support their teams. This is horrendously complex from a, a business point of view. It doesn't need to be. Um, but it's not a burden that they should have. Uh, they should just be able to look forward to going and watching competitive teams every Saturday, week in, week out. Brian, why are the WRU so keen for the regions to join the competition which has been organised by European Rugby Cup? Well, can I first of all say that it is totally unacceptable for the WRU not to come on to a national broadcaster and to defend their position and explain it to people who they will probably describe as, uh, in modern trendy terms, as stakeholders. Yeah. Totally unacceptable. So who are we talking uh, about here, then? When you say the, 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 this is the, these are the men, women, who run Welsh rugby, yes? Yes. Why are they not here um, putting their point? I, I don't know. You'll have to ask them. However, when you go on to talk about you know, the, the question you actually raised, the difficulty is this. They are looking along with the other Celtic nations at the control of the Six Nations, they're afraid that if they lose control there then there will be problems because the French are asking for a wider and more democratic structure to bring in uh, other countries, uh, m minor countries, and, and the whole power struggle, which is nothing really to do with this competition, it's to do with other things, and they're involved in that as well, and that's why I was saying um, but they either have to have total control so they can do that legitimately, or they have to divest control because from a regional's point of view, if you're constantly trying to build a brand and you're making commercial decisions, you don't have to usually go outside to another company and ask whether that's all right. You just get on with it and do the best you can. And that, it's untenable, you know, the way it is. But can I just make another point here? Yeah, sure. What about the, what about the players in this? If there is a plan or it's allowed to go to the wire, as it seems to be, they're uncertain. They are professional. They, this is where they get their mortgage payments. They pay for their food. They pay for their families. Why are they, You can't leave people just hanging on as to whether you will or won't do something at last minute. They've got to plan for their futures, and I wouldn't blame any of them if, they were trying, if their agents were trying to sign them up anywhere, anywhere in the world apart from where they are now, because you simply can't. You know, you've got a responsibility. They've got a responsibility to their, you know, uh, their families, and they they can't allow this situation to exist, and they have to plan accordingly. Well, listening to this is Alistair Eakin, who's at the Ospreys Northampton game. Update on the game first, Al. Uh, well, Northampton currently in the lead by 17 points to three. Ian, that brilliant try from George North and some excellent kicking in the opening half from Stephen Myler. I'd just like to add one thing to what Brian was saying about the, the players being at the centre of this kind of tug of war. One of the one of the things that is so disappointing, for, I think, from a rugby fan perspective, is that all of these politics have become so very personal everything has become very personal and each side seems to be manipulating operations as best they can to get their message across in the right way i mean this is always the way in politics to a degree but for instance just to give you an example i have it on very good authority that uh, at the moment alawin jones is being harassed almost daily on the telephone by those from the wru from roger lewis and warren gatland to sign a central contract so that they can maintain control of him and Presumably that would lead to further central contracts, but what they want is one big signing now, big splash across all the newspapers, lots of momentum behind them, and then suddenly everything begins to fall into place. But it's the use of the media, these constant statements left and right, 
which is not really doing anybody any favours. And when they do so. come to when they do come to talk in a room together, nobody seems to actually talk any sense to each other because they're constantly at each other's throats. It's way too personal. Brian, right, so are you are you talking about one central contract being signed and then publicised? Is that what you're saying? That, that is effectively what I've been told, yeah, but, Brian. Yes. Yeah, but that's not, if you if you're going to have central contracts, you have a system whereby they all get them. You can't just say I'll put two or three. Of no, you no, no, no. I'm talking about in the first. I'm talking about in the first instance. They want one right now so that they can splash it across the media, make a big play of it, and then sign the others. At the moment, they want to sign six, don't they? They want to sign Rhys Priestland and Scott right. Williams. You can't just have six central contracts. What about the other? The other 20-odd, you know, the other people around the squad. No, I couldn't agree more with you. And, of course, what happens next season? If they sign six, what about those who are out of contract next season? What happens with them? Do, do they just make just, a ruling for now? Just I hold, mean, hold your powder flawed. for a second on that, because we're after the news, we're going to discuss central contracts in more detail. And we will talk about rugby, I promise, and the Six Nations, which, of course, is going to be fully covered here on the BBC. Uh, we're discussing the dispute between the WRU and the regions. With me, the Scarlet's Chief Executive Mark Davis and the former England international Brian Moore. The Cardiff Blues chairman, Peter Thomas, said recently he has no confidence in the Welsh Rugby Union Chief Roger Lewis. Is that a sentiment shared by the Ospreys' CEO, Andrew Hoare? Look, to me, it's a wider issue around the governance of the sport. Um, the constitution, uh, from what I can understand, has never been reviewed, whereas I think England have reviewed their constitution recently, New Zealand Cricket's reviewed their constitution. So to me, is we're still uh, running a game under amateur rules in a professional and amateur era where we have two streams to the game. So, um, you know, the whole makeup of our governance, to me, is wrong. And I think it's something that we need to open and be honest about. And I don't think we've got that honesty at the moment. Uh, I also think, as the PwC, PwC report said, greater collaboration. We haven't got any trust. We're not collaborating. We're not working on the issues together. So why is that the way it is? David Moffat used to be in charge of the WRU, fellow mm -hmm. Kiwi. Apparently he's on his way back. He'd like to be the chairman again. Is he potentially a saviour for this situation or might he just antagonise everybody? Oh, I think there's going to be people that feel they can make a contribution and potentially they can. Um, but I think we as regions have got to, we, you know, uh, with Nigel Short, um, Stuart Gallagher, we've, we feel we've got strong representation there. Um, we don't want to antagonise it. We, we actually feel we've got to settle down and, and stick to the core principles we believe in and start to try to talk to the powers that be about how we can bring all this together. And if the Rugby Champions Cup doesn't come to fruition, is the Anglo-Welsh Premiership a genuine a genuine? goer is that a genuine option i think from a regional perspective the thing that we've always suffered with is um because the unions run largely our uh, domestic product when we look at england and france with envy their domestic product is the cake with the erc competition as the icing on the cake with regard to revenue here it's the other way around the erc is the cake with our domestic product just a small thin icing on the cake so for us, to be in a meaningful domestic competition really is quite mouth-watering. Um, and I think to bring back some of those old rivalries, you know, the public, I think, you're near on 80% want that. Um, so from our perspective, it has real merit. Um, but again, there's so much water to go under the bridge over the next 10 to 14 days and a lot of discussions. Are you optimistic, Andrew? Not really. Um, I think there's a lot of damage. Um, and emotional damage and uh, I tell you some days you come off us and uh, I'm up and some days I come in here and it's very gloomy so um, we're just uh, every day we just got to take it as it comes and see what happens. That is very downbeat that's the CEO of the Ospreys Andrew Hoare speaking to Alistair Eakin we are speaking to the, uh, the chief of the Scarlets Mark Davis and also to Brian Moore. Mark first of all do you have confidence still in the WRU's Roger Lewis? Well, I think as Andrew said, it's it's it. Nothing can ever be about one man. Um, uh, certainly, when you're talking about a national game, it it, it can't be about any one individual. So, but uh, on both the region side and the WRU side, um, everybody actually needs to be in the same position, and that's the difficulty that we found over the last two years. Because this isn't a dialogue that's just suddenly appeared uh, ahead of the 31st of December. We've been trying hard to engage 
over the last two years. Andrew referred to the PwC report that uh, where the Welsh Rugby Union implemented PwC to see if they could get a, a clear opinion of where the regions were. Mm-hmm. And the conclusion of that report was that, for example, central contracts on their own weren't the answer. The answer in Welsh rugby is greater collaboration on both sides. And if we work together, it's not that complex. But do you think uh, a, change, a change of personnel at the WRU, are just different people to talk to, would facilitate this, this problem and, and create much better ways of dealing with it? Well, I don't know. I guess that the grass is always greener, isn't it? I mean, at the moment, we're still trying to speak to uh, and still in dialogue with the people that are there. So uh, what we've got to try and do is to make it work as best we can with whoever we're dealing with. But and, they talk to you. They won't talk to us. But do they talk to you? Um, always well, available? Uh, well, we are still in dialogue. I'd go, so I'd go that far. Always available? Mm, probably not. And, and Andrew Hall was speaking there of how depressing it can be, how personal it's got. There's like scar tissue here. Is that how you're finding it as well? Uh, yeah, it's hard. It's hard. Um, uh, Give I me mean, an Brian... example of the per- how this has got personal, because apparently this is what everyone's saying. It's got personal now. This is, this is more than just a sort of uh, a board meeting. No, I think I think where it gets personal is is Brian was referring earlier to the players. Now it's tough for these guys. It's tough for the coaches. It's tough for the supporters. It's tough for the sponsors. That's where it gets personal because every day of life you come into the office, somebody wants to know what the hell's going on. So all of the time you're 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 effectively fielding those concerns, genuine concerns from genuine people that are interested in Welsh rugby Mm. and you can't give them any answers. That's where it gets wearing and that's where it grinds you down. We're talking about the impasse in Welsh rugby. The Scarlet's chief executive, Mark Davis, is with us and so is the former England international and BBC commentator, Brian Moore. Brian, do you think a change of personnel at the WRU would help? Well, it might do. Uh, the, The problem you have, though, as has been already highlighted, if you're working in the same constitution and there will still be, remember, the same political wider political Six Nations aspect of this, the person who comes in, unless they are prepared to go against the hitherto held wisdom, is going to find themselves almost compelled to speak in the same manner. Uh, if if uh, to any extent that there are personalities involved, yes, of course they should be removed and it may help, but there are still going to be those difficulties there. Where do you see a possible solution, Brian? Is there a compromise here? <laughs> is there- well, you, you will, in my opinion, you will not. Get, and I remember, I'm totally neutral. In exactly. This, you know, just, yeah. It, 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 it will not be solved until you give the regions full autonomy, let them do their own thing, or the WRU um, has control. You, or, I suppose, actually, there is a third way, mm-hmm. which is what England have done, and flesh out a long term agreement so everybody knows where they are and everyone gets on with it. But the. the principle of certainty, which has been raised before, is absolutely crucial because, you, you remember, it's not only players that are trying to plan. When sponsors are trying to put their budgets together, they've got two- and three-year plans as well. You can't just make these things up. And this is one of the reasons why I've been so critical of ERC. This brinksmanship where they're going to the last minute so that pressure is on so everyone will panic and force things. That's no good for broadcasters who are signing rights deals. It's no good for sponsors. It's no good for the commercial entities that are trying to plan their activities around them, not knowing exactly what is going to be that they're dealing with. It's just it's a stupid way of going around things. Mark Davis, Chief Executive of Scarlet's, do you think that an Anglo-Welsh competition is feasible? Uh, well, it's certainly feasible. Um, as it stands, as Brian says there, we're, we're, we're just four months out from the end of the season. The English clubs can't put together uh, their season structure for next year because they don't know what's happening in Europe. We don't know what's happening in Europe. We can't fork our season tickets. We can't commit to sponsors. We can't even order our kit at the moment because we haven't got a platform to work from. Now, that's a crazy position to be in. And that's the wider political issue that Brian's referring to, absolutely no doubt. So is it feasible? Yeah, of course it's feasible. I can't see what any reason why it shouldn't be feasible. As Andrew said, it's certainly what the customer wants. Um, if the customer's a, a Welsh rugby supporter, for sure. But practically, um, it's still a heck of a call to actually put that across the, the, the line. And we've still got the next 
couple of weeks to try to get a sensible solution and say, why on earth would you not agree to something that puts another £12 million into Welsh rugby over three years? What's so hard? Brian, on the other, si- on the other side, do you think England may even consider, or the English clubs might even consider, rejoining the Heineken Cup? Uh, it depends on what terms, I suppose, and those terms are so fluid that uh, there's no certainty at all. But just when we're talking about realities, actual realities, people putting the boots on, just to consider this. The WRU at the moment say we will not recognise this competition, so you can't play in it. Uh, and the regions are saying, well, look, you, we, we are not part of this agreement anymore. We haven't renewed it, so, you, you know, so what, what will we do? You, you, at the moment, what is potentially on the table is Welsh players who are preparing for the World Cup in 2015 not actually having a competition to play in. And <laughs> how good is that? It's, a, it's an absolute joke. I mean, I tell you, we'll be loving this. The Australians will be loving this because they're in the same pool. <laughs> Mm, absolutely. Uh, I just think there's been a try in the game between the uh, Ospreys and Northampton. Let's go back to Alistair Eakin. Yeah, better news for uh, for this particular Welsh region, Ian. They have their try, the Ospreys. It's been scored by Rhys Webb. A lot of pressure on the Northampton try line and the scrum half just darting over from around about two metres uh, to score their first try of the game. And it's been converted. So Northampton now leading by 17 points to 10. Uh, but they are down a man. Christian Day uh, was shown a yellow card around about five or six minutes ago. So they're down to 14 men. Ospreys back in the hunt. And we've got, what, 14 minutes left to play. Ospreys 10, Northampton 17. We are discussing the problems in international and regional rugby at the moment with the WRU and the regions in Wales at loggerheads and no agreement seemingly in sight. As Chris Jones mentioned before two o'clock, some members of the current national Welsh squad, including Lee Halfpenny, the captain Sam Warburton, haven't decided where they're going to be playing next season yet. They're waiting to see what tournaments the regions are going to actually be involved in before choosing whether to sign new contracts. A number of leading Welsh players have in recent seasons moved to clubs in France and England. We've mentioned George North with that wonder try earlier. Well, the regions say that they're struggling to hold on to players because they cannot compete with the wages on offer elsewhere. They hope a new European club tournament, which is what they're hoping to join, will provide them with the funds, possibly an extra one million pounds a year to keep their best players what how desperate is the financial problem mark in wales at the moment trying to hold on to your best players uh was very tough um and and that's the reality and look at the end of the day there's always going to be some degree of drain but just to put it into perspective if you take the league that we play in the one tv deal that's been agreed for the league that we play in so far is a 5.5 million pounds deal for the whole league Mm -hmm. uh, across 12 teams Mm -hmm. uh the french clubs have just turned down 63 million euros now that's reality between how many clubs uh, that would be between the top 14 clubs. Wow. So the reality is, if you express over the next uh, five years, then the gap is only going to get greater unless we've got the right commercial platform with the right product on the field. Right, tell us about central contract. What exactly would a central contract entail, in your opinion, and why would it be beneficial or otherwise? Uh, well, I think that's a real good question, because I've yet to see a definition of central contracts that I can understand. Um, about two years ago, we started suggesting that there may be uh, a better model of contracting across Welsh professional rugby, and that's something that we should work towards. Various uh, proposals that we've put in, nothing really coherent back until very recently. Um, Now, recently, what we seem to be hearing is the possibility of some form of national contract with the contract held by the union and then the the player uh, placed in their existing, in their pre-existing region, but for a very limited number of players. Your commentator earlier on referred to the fact that he'd heard of six. And as Brian was saying, well, how does that work then when you've got a squad of 26 or a call-up of 36? Mm. So... Quite how that works is beyond us at the moment. What do you think of central contracts then, Brian? Well, it can work, and they obviously do work in Ireland and Scotland, and they indeed, or whilst they're not the same in England, they're not central contracts in the way that they determine certain things within the participation agreement between the RFU uh, you know, and the uh, English clubs. 
it is known that the a certain number of players will be in the elite squad and that they are therefore bound by that protocol that relates to them. Uh, the Saxon squad is the same, but it's for the whole squad. I simply don't understand how you can propose to take six people or even less than the full squad and say, well, you are on the Because of the players they were worried, what if he loses form? And I'm in better form, uh, and I was on the bench, but now I'm in there. Mm-hmm. And yet he's getting more money than me. And that's natural. And, and why wouldn't you think that? It's, it's, it's completely, uh, again, I use the word, it's stupid. Mark, from, from a player's point of view, and looking at the regions in, in Wales, if you have Welsh internationals playing both in England and also, of course, in France, is that going to affect the Welsh team? What, what is the selection process for players not playing in Wales? Uh, well, it doesn't affect the selection process, interestingly enough, in Wales. So whilst it affects the selection process clearly in England um, and in New Zealand, uh, there's no requirement to play in Wales to be selected for the national team. Do you think team. there should be? Absolutely. Do you think that's right, Brian? Do you think there should be? Right. Only if you can offer... Well, actually, first of all, only if you can offer them a tournament to play. That's one thing. Mm. And secondly, that that tournament is sufficient for them to fulfil their playing talent. Because if you don't if you do not do that, I don't see how you can fit so Mark, it. So, what, yeah, OK. So, Mark, what would the argument be? Say you look, took the, the, the example of football. I know it's different and you can explain the differences. But say you're living in Belgium and you want to see your national team play. They have a very good national football team and it's seven or eight of their first 11 play in England. I mean, you would, in your world, you would actually stop all those players playing for the national Belgian side, would you? Well, from our point of view, if if exactly the same as the situation in England and New Zealand, then if it is helpful to the performance of the Welsh national team for players to operate in the environment of Wales with the additional release and with the additional uh, conditioning and medical facilities that uh, uh, they then have access to, then that's got to make sense for the national team's performance and it's got to make sense for the regional team's performance and it gives a different dimension to the pure commercial dimension of the uh, financial might of particularly the French sides, which is only going to increase over the next five years. Presumably, Brian, and with your legal background, maybe you can help us with this, that this this would be a restraint of trade, wouldn't it, if you said you're not allowed to go and play elsewhere? Um, Don't play elsewhere. Selection is a different matter, um, because that's a subjective uh, issue, and as England has said, uh, it doesn't preclude you from actually... I don't think you said you will not play, but they've just said you will be not looked on as favourably. And <laughs> if you think about it, that's got to be right, because you do not want, ideally, all your players flying in from various you know, leagues around Europe or indeed why, the world. Why not? Because they are the best players. Why not, though? Because it is better if they are local, they can all get together more quickly, they don't have the rigours of travel, they don't have the ability and effects of travel, they're not taken out of the environment and taken into other environments which may or may not be the way in which Welsh rugby nationally are trying to play. And when you come down to it, you want your players to play in front of your fans if you can possibly achieve that. The Welsh public deserve that. Just bring in uh, Alistair Eakin. What do you think of what you've heard about central contracts, Alistair? Well, I, I just think it's... Um... <laughs> It's one of those issues. It's going to be very, very difficult to to make it work. Uh, um, quite apart from all the dispute and, and anger and upset that it will cause if it if they try to implement it. I think the one of the interesting things is at what stage will the Welsh national team start to suffer from the player exodus because they've had the most incredible decade haven't they they've scored uh, what three grand slams they've had in uh, in the last uh, well in eight seasons or so- something of that nature um, they've been carrying all before them a rugby world cup semi-final but if their players continued across the the channel and head into france they get pounded playing for france they they're uh, playing in french sides they earn a lot of money but they're asked to play a huge amount of rugby just to give you an idea of that johnny sexton of course previously of leinster an irish but uh, nevertheless it's relevant in this context plays for Racing Metro now and after the first 10 weeks of his season he played more for Racing Metro than he had done in the entirety of the season before for Leinster Northampton by the way have just scored another try so they're going to move uh, 22 points to 10 up uh, here it's at the Liberty like Stadium it's almost like live rugby is kind of incidental isn't it we talk about this massive story and rugby sort of going on around it nobody knows where they're going to be playing it, it is, that, that is that is to me the crux of it all 
football because it's the fans who suffer. They want to be watching their big stars, you know, like Lee Halfpenny and Sam Warburton. They want to watch them week in, week out in Wales, not in France. They can't watch them play for, for Racing Metro in Paris or for Toulouse down in the south of France. It's no good. And, and at some point, the national team will suffer, although at the moment, they're still doing extremely well. Let's uh, give a final point to, to Mark, who, of course, is uh, with the Scarlets, the, the head of the Scarlets. Mark, what's your final thought on this and your, on your, your immediate wish, really? Um, well, my final thought is that I don't believe that there's anything that we've been attempting to do over the last two years to work closely and collaborate with the Welsh Rugby Union that is difficult. Uh, there's only five parties involved. There's four regions, one union. It's not difficult. I don't believe that uh, a competition, a well-structured competition that can bring another £12 million into Welsh Rugby over the next three years is a difficult decision. So what would be really helpful is if we could just get on and make some decisions. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. Thank you to Brian Moore as well. That uh, was the Chief Executive of Scarlet's, Mark Davis, and we'll keep you up to date with the live rugby as it happens throughout the afternoon here on Five Live.